um, a great pleasure to be here to be celebrating uh, Robin's career and his uh, new award tomorrow, one of many. And it's great to be, uh, I think this is the first time I've presented in Edinburgh for 30 years probably. Um, so I'm going to be talking about quantitative genetics of disease, which is what I now work on. So, but I'm going to start like everybody else, how I first met Robin. It was in 1986. I was just finishing my master's degree at Cornell and there was the World Congress of uh, Genetics Applied to Livestock Production, which was in Lincoln, Nebraska, which many of us here went to, well known for not having any alcohol. And uh, Robin was at that meeting and he somehow was going on to, I think, a statistics meeting in Seattle. Biometrics. Biometrics. And he managed to invite himself onto a road trip where we were going from Lincoln to Bozeman, Montana, which Google now says is 15 hours. It certainly seemed a lot longer than that. Um, and so, uh, well, we had a lot of interesting times visiting the Badlands, but I don't know if there's any PhD students here, but it was certainly an interesting way to start a PhD. Um, I'll let you fill in the details of 15 hours in a car, uh, followed by barn dances at the Beef Improvement Federation meeting. Um, but I suppose what I learned from there is how to deal with Robin as a supervisor, and that is to tease him endless, endlessly. So you heard this morning from John about how I spent my PhD. I spent it really uh, very much looking at this five-page paper by Alan Robinson um, and leading to these papers which you heard about this morning from John. So I'm not going to talk about that but rather to say that one of the key things that I learnt through that PhD research was thinking about um, what happens during selection. So thinking about your normal distribution of phenotype, how you select individuals to be the parents of the next generation, and then really if you think about the variances and covariances and the means of distributions, uh, how you work out what those variances and covariances are conditioned on the effect of selection in a, in a particular generation. So it's the, the, the impact of uh, the selection, that conditional, um, uh, the effect of conditioning. So now I work on disease, and of course there are very many strong parallels where you're thinking uh, if disease is polygenic, and there's many reasons for us to think that common diseases are polygenic, that those who are affected at the top end of the distribution and uh, then you want to think about variances and covariances with their relatives. And so now you're thinking about conditioning on, the, uh, on, uh, uh, on people being diseased. And there's lots and lots of parallels then in, in, um, in those sorts of calculations. And so to be honest, I've built a bit of a career being able to do a few sums on a normal distribution. So I now work on complex common diseases, so just to be clear what those are, these are the diseases which are common in society, which everyone knows about, you know lots of people who are affected, immune disorders, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and I now particularly work on disorders of the brain, neurological disorders and psychiatric disorders. So these common complex diseases are diseases that have lifetime risk greater than a half percent. We uh, describe the genetic contribution through heritability, um, and often that's the information to estimate heritability is usually, usually from increased risk to relatives and often only first degree relatives. So moving into quantitative genetics of disease, I realised that a lot of groundwork had actually been done through the Edinburgh School. And these, of course, are people who many of us remember fondly and were certainly around when I was doing my PhD. And so Douglas Faulkner in 1965 um, very much recognised for the theory under the liability threshold model, although when you read the paper it was clear that the methodology was around and he just felt like he was, many, a lot of it was writing it down. Um, a very uh, nice paper. Uh, Charlie Smith, who of course came, went from human genetics into livestock, no, went from livestock genetics to human genetics and back again. So by the time I was doing my PhD he was very much in livestock genetics, but he wrote it important paper in 1970 about um, understanding concordance of twins and heritability of liability. And then uh, Alan Robinson, of course, has also worked on heritability of threshold characters. Um, so Peter and I don't actually look at each other's slides, so this is very much saying what he was saying, that one thing 
moving from livestock genetics to human genetics, you kind of get a different perspective and realize that those of us trained in livestock genetics really come from the, the Fisher School, where you write things down as a linear model, whereas um, uh, many, well, the, the human geneticists who uh, were working on complex traits would come, had come through more the Sewell right, where they, as Peter said, they think about things in these very complicated path coefficient diagrams. Um, and so, but I think that's changing over time, and that's changing partly with the big data sets, and, and the human geneticists are moving now more to this uh, linear model way of thinking. So, again, moving from, uh, from livestock genetics to human genetics, one of the things that struck me about the differences is uh, the concept of within family variation. And I really feel that uh, it's something that's actually taken for granted in the livestock community because you realize that you have the selection and every generation more variation is, is generated and it's, it's that variation that is, is being used for selection. Whereas in, in human genetics, because we don't really have very big families, people don't really have that uh, understanding about how much variation is generated each generation when you've got a polygenic trait. Um, so, Peter was going to talk about from Remmel to Gremmel. He didn't talk about that very much, but one of the things that he is known for is taking uh, Remmel into the human genetics uh, data. And, uh, and that was... Uh, that initial transition was working on human height, which is a quantitative trait, which we use as, as a model trait. And I was very keen that we should immediately try and transfer that methodology into thinking about a disease trait. And so um, this was in 2011. We were working on uh, Gremmel for uh, disease traits. And there you can see, if you just imagine what the relationship matrix is, um, you can really just imagine it in these four blocks. You've got the relationships between cases and cases, between controls and controls, and the off-diagonals are between cases and controls. And so the information that's coming when you're estimating, um, trying to work out variation attributable to, um, in this case, to uh, SNPs, which are measured genome-wide, um, that the information is, is really coming from how how are cases more similar to each other genetically than, than control pairs, in case control pairs. Um, so in livestock genetics, I think that you, there are threshold traits, um, for example, calving difficulty, but uh, I think in livestock, uh, you're tending to use a, a population, whereas a key thing in uh, human traits uh, is that we are using uh, case control samples. So there's a big oversampling of cases compared to the population. And so we can apply gre uh, Gremmel estimation to understand the proportion of variance uh, that's uh, contributing to a trait. But one of the key things is what is the scale of that estimate. Um, and so this is where doing some sums on a normal distribution comes in. So the estimate is made on the observed scale, but it's, uh, and so Robertson in 1950 uh, provided a transformation based on the normal distribution of transforming the heritability on the observed scale to the heritability on the liability scale. And you can see that it's dependent on the proportion of the sample that are, uh, are affected or, or have your... your um, your disease trait. So this is uh, a relationship which was developed based uh, assuming an additive relationship between the heritability in the observed scale and the heritability on the liability scale. And to be honest, I don't think it had ever been very useful because this is a linear approximation and uh, if you estimate this heritability on the observed scale from, fam from close families, the linear approximation breaks down. But actually, um, when we start applying it to the sorts of data sets that we have, where um, when we're making this relationship matrix in livestock, if you're making a relationship matrix based on, on SNP data, you've got a lot of close relatives in there. If you tried to get rid of the relatives, there wouldn't be anything left. But in the human data sets, we, um, 
because we're using the information about how related people are to each other, but just, um, just the very small relationships, so we, we actually get rid of close relatives. Um, uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, so, yeah, so uh, it, it, the human data is, is different in that sense. And the reason that we do that is we, we, uh, we want to make sure that we are using information which is uh, not, co not uh, confounded with uh, environmental factors or non-additive non, uh, non genetic factors. So we're using very, very tiny genetic relationships so that they, the additivity of this relationship uh, holds. But this wasn't uh, sufficient because this is assuming a population sample. So one of the things we had to do was recognize in our case control samples, these cases were totally oversampled compared to controls. And so um, again, using normal distribution theory, work out how to, to make this adjusted uh, transformation uh, to take the estimate which has been made on this case control scale to the liability scale. Um, so our ability to do this, to use SNP data to uh, estimate the contribution, uh, genetic contribution to disease was actually a really important step, partly because heritability estimates, as I say, for disease traits were based, usually based just on uh, uh, first degree relatives uh, very often. And then uh, there could be confounding with uh, common environment. So getting estimates which uh, are basically showing the genetic sharing which is from uh, people who are very distantly related was, was an important uh, step. So just to give an example of this, uh, I worked on schizophrenia, I work on schizophrenia and in schizophrenia there was a very hot debate about genetic architecture. So this is 2007, so only uh, 10 years ago where prominent people in the human genetics community would say that schizophrenia is, is a disease of multiple rare alleles, and other people would say, no, it's polygenic. And so this is a timeline of discovery of risk loci for schizophrenia. So on the x-axis, we've got time. On the y-axis, number of uh, loci identified. And now you can see we're up here over 100 loci, and in fact, this has now gone up to 250. Um, but back in 2009, when the first of these genome-wide association studies uh, were published, only 3,000 cases and 3,000 controls, this study identified only one genome-wide significant locus. So at that point, people were ready to throw in the towel and say, we, you've tried this paradigm, it's not working, it's not common disease, it's not polygenic, let's go down a different route, it's clearly it's rare alleles, it's, it, um, it's clearly a different architecture. And the sort of analyses that we applied to these data using, um, for example, Greville, demonstrated that there was a genetic component and gave the community the impetus to say, if we increase uh, our sample sizes, we will make more discovery. It's just that the genetic architecture was such that we needed larger sample sizes given the level of multiple testing. So to give you another example of how I've used uh, the normal distribution type theory that I learned with Robin, was I also work on major depression. So major depression is a common disorder, very debilitating. We all know people who are very uh, who are affected by depression. It's not just feeling sad, it's, it's really uh, impacting daily life. And again, the genome-wide association studies were conducted for depression, and rather than Manhattan, we were getting Holland. Um, and again, many people in the field, and we were getting this when, we, so for schizophrenia, we were starting to see signals, so it's starting to look like Manhattan, and we, when we had the sample sizes of the same size for depression, we weren't. So again, people in the field were, were ready to throw in the towel and say, depression is too heterogeneous, uh, it's not going to work. So I did a few calculations to say, well, let's remember schizophrenia has got a lifetime risk of, of 1%, Major depression has got a lifetime risk of 10 to 15 percent. And so there's the difference, the mean difference, if you thought about it on the liability scale, is much smaller between cases and controls for de depression con to compared to schizophrenia. And so that means that not all genome-wide association studies are created equal. And if we just take account of this difference in, in prevalence, 
I calculated we needed sample sizes two to three times bigger. And if we also take account of the fact that there's a difference in heritability, so a difference in the contribution of the genetic factors, if we make assumptions that the number of loci underpinning the, the disease might be the same, then I got an estimate that we needed sample sizes four to five times as big. And so again, that gave impetus to the community to say we should, we should carry on. Uh, and I'm very pleased to say that um, this is from our consortium. I'm very actively involved, as is Andrew in the audience and uh, many others in the audience with this consortium. And we had a paper published in May this year, which uh, has got us off, off the block with 45 variants identified. I hear from uh, David, who's working in Andrew's group, that this is now over 100. And very nicely, my five times prediction worked very well. Another example, if I've got time, is um, the estimation of genetic correlations between disease. Um, and so this is work that I conducted with the Cross Disorder Group from the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. And what we're showing here is the estimation of heritability attributable to genome-wide SNPs in dark green for different psychiatric disorders, ADHD, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, major depression and then co-heritabilities um, between these disorders. And so this again was using REML technology and this was, I think, a really important application because until this point it's been very hard to work out whether there were genetic relationships between diseases. Because if you think about it, how would you estimate a genetic relationship between diseases? You'd have to have very, very large cohorts of people measured and their family measured members measured for two diseases. And when diseases aren't very common in the population, when there's differences in age of onset, uh, tracing families, it's actually very hard to collect those data sets. In the Scandinavian countries, it's maybe possible uh, with their registries. But now we can take these genome-wide uh, genome association data sets, which have been totally independently collected for different disorders, and using information from people who are genetically related uh, you know, very distantly, sh demonstrate which diseases are genetically related to each other. And so, as I say, I was leading this work, but uh, one thing I learned from, from working with Robin is never believe your own results and really try and bash them around. And so one of the things that I was very worried about is that these results could be generated by uh, misdiagnosis between disorders. So again, I think a training in being able to do a little bit of methodology um, allowed me to think about this and say, well, I'm hoping that I've got this set up where I've got one disease with cases and controls and another disease with cases and controls, and, I'm, and this is, I'm estimating the genetic relationship between these. But what happens if I've got some level of misdiagnosis where some of these cases actually have been misdiagnosed to be cases here and the other way around? And so, again, this paper is much, much less cited than this one, but in a way I'm, I'm more proud because it just makes me feel, makes, made me feel uh, confident that the results presented here were correct. So what I've done in my short time is just given you a few examples of the way in which the training with Robin um, has helped me uh, find the, the questions which I think have helped contribute in... Uh, quantitative genetics of disease um, and, and use a little bit of theory to, to find the answers. And here are a few more examples I've published on and to publish on today, male pattern baldness, but for obvious reasons, looking around the room, I didn't talk about that. Um, the last thing I'd like to say is I was fortunate in 2015 to give a presentation at the American Society of Human Genetics in their precision medicine uh, symposium. And this was a slide that I presented. So telling people in the human genetics community what's going on in livestock. Because basically, now in human genetics, the data sets are getting bigger. The, uh, the structure of the data sets is getting more similar to livestock genetics. In uh, humans, people are often talking about collecting information on, on iPhones. I show them this and say, well, in cattle, it's been going on a long time. The data sets are much bigger. Any model that you might think you want to uh, apply in, in human data actually has already been applied in livestock data. Go and, and read the literature. And as Peter mentioned, the UK Biobank, that's been disruptive in, in the field. Uh, 500,000 people with lots of uh, phenotypic data, still small compared to the, the uh, cattle data. 
as you'll see, University of Queensland ranking high in its usage of that data set. So this provides my segue into an advertisement. Um, in 2020, two years from now, we've got the International Congress of Quantitative Genetics. So I'm highlighting it so you can plan ahead, get your budgets. And I think it's going to be a very exciting conference because it is the one conference where we bring together the plant breeders, the um, uh, uh, livestock breeders, the uh, model species, and the human genetics community. And I think, as I say, with our data sets now, there's a lot of convergence and, and a lot of uh, really interesting cross-talk. Cross so we're going to have pre and post uh, 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 workshops, and just reminding you, it is our winter, but still might be two degrees warmer than an Edinburgh summer. Um, I'm also going to acknowledge my funding and the group. Uh, Peter and I lead the group with Zhang Yang, and as Peter said, this is, this is our group in Brisbane, a good place to come and uh, maybe spend some time before the conference at uh, University of Queensland. We also have Ben Hayes, as you all know, and um, uh, Mark Blows, in, uh, who works on Drosophila genetics. So I'm going to end my talk with, again, a thanks to Robin for setting me up well in my research career and for many fond memories, uh, and this is one of them. Uh, Chris has already shown these. This is at uh, Peter and I, for my wedding, and this is the famous pig song. So I'm sure that's going to be in your talk this afternoon, Robin.